to Silicon Grapevine. Uh, this is Nitin Dahad. I'm your host uh, with the Times, and I'm here today with Charlie Janak, who is CEO of Arteris IP. Hello, Charlie. Hello. Uh, good to uh, be on your uh, podcast. Great. Well, uh, good to have you. So, Ch- Charlie, just tell us a little bit about uh, you. Uh, so, you are um, CEO of Arteris IP. Tell us a little bit about that and uh, and wh- where you're located and 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 what kind of things the company does. So Arteris is, is a leading company in, in what we call system IP. And uh, the thing that uh, system IP does, it helps assemble a chip. So we don't make processors, uh, we don't make memories, we don't make files. We essentially help all those IPs, uh, our customers, uh, enable our customers to, to assemble all those IPs together into a chip uh, more efficiently, more quickly, with with higher levels of, of quality. And one of the things that got us on the map is our terrorists uh, invented something called network on chip, which is use of networking techniques inside semiconductor chips. So instead of having dedicated wires, you basically were shipping data packets around the chip, which is more efficient, lower power, uh, higher performance. And so from that, we expanded into SOC integration automation with our Magellum acquisition in, in 2020 uh, and with our Semi4 acquisition in 2022. And so, um, you know, our goal is to help our customers assemble SOCs uh, quicker than any other way possible. Excellent. Okay. Well, uh, what, what uh, the idea of this show is uh, for us to talk a little bit about you as well. You've been, you've been uh, about um, well, 40, just 40 years in this, in this industry. Started in um, 1983. Tell us how you got into the industry. I mean, you were doing a, an MBA at Stanford, and uh, you actually just uh, managed to sort of catch up on a, a, a luminary of our industry. Yeah, so so I, I had a, a summer job at a, at a company called Victor Technologies, uh, which uh, whose CEO decided that he did not have to be IBM compatible when the uh, uh, when the IBM PC came out in in early '83. Uh, so that did not turn out to be a good strategic decision. And so I was the only member of my Stanford MBA class of 84 to have gotten laid off. And so I had a month to kill the beach in Santa Cruz. And literally uh, a couple of days later, I got a call from a gentleman by the name of Jim Solomon, who said, hey, uh, we're trying to hire a friend of yours uh, who works for Bell Labs. And he said, I need to talk to you. So can you get together for dinner? So I said, yes. And uh, uh, he presented a plan for building an integrated uh, um, uh, circuit uh, CAT system. Uh, I thought it was a brilliant idea. I, I thought I was uh, very enthusiastic about it. I, I wrote a, a paper in, at Stanford Business School on uh, an architectural CAD um, business. And so I kind of understood what he was talking about. And so he said, great, why don't you join the company? I, uh, I'm, I'm hiring engineers, but you obviously know something about the business. So I would like to be the acting CFO of uh, of this startup company. So I yeah. said, sure, and uh, uh, joined SDA, and uh, uh, I managed to still complete my classes for the second year of uh, of Stanford. But uh, basically, SDA uh, by nineteen, I guess nineteen eighty six, uh, became uh, Cadence uh, through the merger of uh, of ECAD, and uh, you know I wound up uh, having a variety of positions in sales, in marketing, and uh, but mostly, mostly sales and sales and market. So, I mean, tell us about that journey because um, uh, that actually uh, you were second employee of SDA. You worked with Jim Solomon, the founder. When it became a uh, cadence, um, was that something of a change uh, from what you expected when you started? I mean, uh, yeah, you you probably didn't know what you were expecting when you started anyway. But did it sort of go along the same path? Oh, abs- absolutely. Uh, it was several different companies in its existence, right? When there's, uh, you know, five or six of you in uh, in the Jim Solomon's condo, uh, it's a very different enterprise than uh, when you basically are 580 million and, and public with, uh, you know, multiple hundreds of employees. And so one of those things uh, that I learned is as the company changes, it actually becomes a different company you yourself have to become a different person. You have to accommodate uh, the different transitions uh, uh, personally, otherwise uh, the company will pass you by. And so 
the growth of the company has to be matched by the growth of your yourself as a person uh, and, and as, as, an, as, a, as an executive. And uh, toward the end of my 10 year stint at Cadence, people said, well, yeah, what are you the most proud of uh, of those 10 years? And I, you know, I did a lot of things at, at Cadence, but my, my answer was that I survived uh, uh, <laughs> because uh, those transitions are, are not necessarily easy. And uh, you know, I have uh, tremendous admiration for people like Arda Juice at Synopsis, who basically took the company from the lab or with a with a uh, Berkeley product, and then basically uh, uh, you know retired, uh, running a three billion dollar company. Right, so um, that's uh, that's fairly rare. But um, you know, I, I did a lot of things at uh, at Cadence. Um, I uh, essentially. Uh, shipped their first product that actually made any money, which was called the standard someplace in Iraq called Standard Edge. Uh, I opened up Silicon Valley sales. I opened up Europe. And then uh, with Jim Solomon, uh, we started the uh, King's Analog Division, which was one of the most successful things that, uh, that King's has done at the time. And so, uh, you know, it was a, it, it was a stint that uh, I'm very proud of. And I, I really liked the people that I worked with. And what was the... Um... Uh, the the thing that sort of stimulated or triggered the move uh, to do something else after Cadence, <laughs> oh, or, or you know, well, you were, when you were at Cadence, yeah. What did you think? Okay, I was young and foolish because uh, basically I wanted to be a CEO of a company, um, okay. and that that was unlikely to happen with Joe Costello there at Cadence. Um, and uh, I thought that you know, hey, you know, we built this big successful company, uh, we can do it again. And not realizing how special it is to build a long-term sustainable company uh, that can basically grow its business uh, for decades on end, right? And mm-hmm. so um, the stint after Cadence was not, not I would say, not particularly easy. It's a company called HLD Systems, the first floor planning company, and uh, uh, you know that's uh, it was a, an interesting, interesting company to run uh, up to the. Uh, the Cadence, uh, Cadence experience. Uh, and and uh, is that, that become Smart Machines or was that another, another role? No, no. Smart Machines, we started, uh, we started Smart Machines uh, with the idea that as fabs became more automated, we were going to uh, um, build direct drive robotics, which were more reliable uh, because basically an hour of downtime in a fab costs you $150,000, right? So then we were going to build uh, more complicated robotics. And so uh, this was a really fun business, beautiful product, uh, really, really enjoyed it. And it was a very, very difficult business. Um, and then we, we wound up selling it successfully to, uh, to Brooks Automation. And I uh, spent about a year, year with, uh, with Brooks after that. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating now you know, when you think about what you were doing then in the 90s and, and look at the fabs now, uh, yeah, the automation, the robotics. Uh, there's such a, a, a very rapid evolution of that technology. Oh yeah, no, no, it, it, it's it, it's it's fascinating. You know, I love manufacturing. My my grandfather was uh, ran a manufacturing company, and so I got to visit a bunch of different fabs. And uh, one of those things, uh, for example, the Japanese at the time in the in the in the late '80s, early '90s, there were. They were basically the kings of semiconductor yeah. manufacturing. Yeah. But when you went into one, I went into one of their fabs, and you basically had uh, the AGVs, the automatic guided vehicles, in the same plane as the people that were doing the operations that the, 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 the automation couldn't do. And this particular fab, they were very proud of that. They said, we have uh, $600 million of working process wafer inventory in this fab. So I walked out and I said to one of my colleagues, I says, we did not tour a wafer fab. We toured a prison for wafers, <laughs> right? And so, uh, so, so basically, uh, you know, the, the, the fabs got, uh, you know, you wind up running the automation ceiling. You kept dropping things down all to automate it, uh, 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 pot openers, and then tools were loaded automatically. So the, so the automation actually made a huge economic difference in 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 the viability of of semi semiconductor fabs as it does today. Mm-hmm. I remember 
Was it last year or the year before? I went to the Global Foundries Fab in Dresden, and and yeah, just like seeing that in action uh, was just amazing. And yeah, that's kind of indicative of what's going on right now. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a really it's a really fun things to work on. Uh, and Brooks Automation was a was one of the leaders in the world in in this particular in this particular space. And so uh, yeah, you know, it was it was really fun to be involved uh, involved with that. Okay, and then uh, so let's move that timeline. I think Smart Machines sold in 1999, and uh, and then the you did a few stints. And how did you end up at Arteris? Well, I yeah, I, I had a couple of interesting stints between that, um, but but the main one was uh, Infinity Capital, so the VC mm -hmm. firm, the venture capital firm that funded uh, um, uh, Smart Machines, said, "Hey, would you like to be an entrepreneur in residence?" And uh, so I spent a year at uh, being a, essentially a contractor or consultant for for this venture firm, and that was very very interesting to sit on the other side of uh, of the uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, game where you're actually deciding who gets the money, how do you uh, <laughs> manage the investments. And what you realize that, uh, you know, things are not easy for anyone. And that, uh, uh, you know, some of the VCs that were giving you some certain amounts of advice actually weren't all that skilled. But on the other hand, what you realize is that because they see a portfolio of opportunities, they get a certain amount of wisdom for seeing multiple companies mm. and that basically mm. uh, they learn to recognize patterns. And right. and so I also gained a tremendous uh, respect for uh, for what a good venture capitalist is and, and to recognize one. I uh, worked for a guy by the name of Sam Lee who was the lead partner of uh, of, uh, of Infinity Capital. And and so it was just a great experience to be on the, on the other side of it and then, you know, I took uh, basically a vacation in uh, uh, in Italy because you know I was uh, spending you know a couple startups. My kids were, you know, I told my wife, I said, hey, uh, if I take another job uh, next week, uh, you know, by the time I get things processed, the kids will be out of high school. So we decided that we're going to move to Florence, and I played Mr. Mom for two years. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so, um, and then, and then Arteris. So, so we were buying a house in France, um, and uh, um, the the issue in France is that they have something called a wealth tax, which is basically a form of double taxation. If you buy a house that's over a certain amount of money, uh, you actually have to pay a certain percentage of that purchase price forever. Uh, so, one way to get out of it was to borrow. Um, and uh, and so nobody wanted to lend me any money because I didn't have a job. I was on vacation. Of course, I could pay for the house, uh, just write a check for it. But the uh, you literally at the same time, it's kind of like the years of the eight uh, Literally at the same time, I get a call from Wayne Cantwell, who was uh, uh, on the board of directors of a company uh, called Terrace, and say, "Hey, do you want to run this company?" And I said, <laughs> "Wow, it's commutable from the house." Uh, so I basically joined our terrace to make the house work. And uh, I don't have the house anymore, but I still have the company. So yeah, that's a real fascinating um, sort of uh, example. You have two examples of serendipity there. You know, one with SDA and one with Arteris. But uh, you happen to be in the right place at the right time uh, with somebody needed something. Yeah, because I was already in Europe, um, and and so uh, what the company, what the problem with Arteris, one of the problems with Arteris was. That as a French company, uh, they viewed themselves as a French company, mm. and the French are not particularly kind to startup companies. Um, their their whole system is to support these national champions, which are these large industrial companies. So very quickly, I realized that we had to become global. And to this day, even though our terrace is, is very successful, I think we only have three or four French customers. Um, so one of my contributions at Arteris was said, okay, we're going to be an IP company because none of the other business plans are viable. And two, we're going to get global as quickly as possible. And so the success of Arteris is really a combination of French engineering, which I gain tremendous respect for, and American marketing. And uh, that turned out to be a good combination. 
it tends to be a good combination for a lot of European companies, I think. Uh, and uh, yeah, nowadays, uh, yeah, you you see sort of French public money like BPI France, whatever, going into a lot of startups, and um, and then you know the the combination of the French funded startup and American marketing, um, I think, it is is still common. Yeah, yeah, and and we made it work. We we had a fantastic engineering team, or at least not in the beginning, but we 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 arrived at a fantastic engineering team after a few years of of, of trying. And uh, we had uh, uh, people like Philippe Di Crescenzo, who was an EP of engineering. We had people like Philippe Martel, um, uh, Boris Bertillier. Uh, uh, so really, uh, really fantastic engineers. Uh, you know, the highest compliment I ever got in my entire life. Uh, was from uh, Philippe Crescenzo, who basically said uh, I was working out of the U.S. We moved the headquarters to the U.S. He goes, Charlie, we trust you to do your job, and you trust us to do ours. <laughs> and that was the highest top of that. And so, how long did you spend in in France before moving? Uh, two and a half years. Uh, two and a half years. And so, so basically, we got an investment in in 2007 from Synopsis, and okay. Synopsis wanted to deal with a U.S. entity. And so we went from a French company with a U.S. subsidiary to a U.S. company with a uh, with a French subsidiary. So okay. it's all a flip. So we left all the engineering uh, in uh, in France. And then I asked my kids, I said, hey, where do you want to finish high school? Do you want to finish in the U.S. or in the or France? And they said, well, we'd like to move back to the U.S. So we moved the headquarters to uh, um, uh, the U.S. and uh, and and uh, essentially kept the Entire, pretty much the entire engineering team with France, which worked very well. So, what's the, what was the? Um, I mean, how have you seen the growth um, of, of Arteris since you joined to what it is today in 2024? Well, uh, up to the end of 2023. But uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the growth, the expansion, uh, some facts and figures. Ah, so, uh, when I first joined, I. I I said, oh my God, this company never should have started. Um, <laughs> because one of the things that happened was that we were we had this network on chip technology, but the chips were not particularly complex at the time. There was one processor, maybe two channels of memory, uh, maybe a couple IOs, and, and you could do that fairly easily with the hybrid bus. Um, so we were we were rescued by the 40 nanometer. Uh, a generation of of, uh, of chips, and the fact that mobile, that smartphone chips became very complex, and there was the architecture that had many to many communication, which actually could greatly benefit from network on chip, and that's kind of what made the company. And so we got um, uh, a fairly major order from Texas Instruments uh, for the OMAC chips, and that kind of put the company on the map. And uh, by two thousand, by twenty. 13, we were in 20 out of 23 mobile uh, chip uh, companies. Uh, so the company became very successful on, on the back of increasing complexity of, uh, of the chips and the fact that we, over time, we had a very high rate of learning because we were dealing with so many companies that we were able to build a really great product called FlexStop. And so, so in the 2005, yeah, in in those years that you've been with Arteris, like uh, how many people were then, how many people now, and kind of like uh, where are you in terms of that growth? Yeah, so uh, so our current that should be in two companies, but uh, that's, a, that's another story. But um, when I joined, I think there were ten people, maybe eleven. Okay. Uh, yeah. And right now we're something uh, around two hundred fifty. Okay, so it's, it's quite sizable, and it's quite interesting. You talked about. Yeah, getting on the back of you know the mobile phone and Texas Instruments, I think uh, you can tell another similar story with ARM a few years prior. So I think uh, that was quite a interesting uh, way of, of of getting that growth. Yeah, ARM executed beautifully uh, with uh, low power low power compute, and uh, uh, you know to this day ARM is a is a valuable partner, even though we compete a little bit on the on the system like PN. Um, mm. You know about I would say 75, 80% of our customers use on processors. Hmm. And um, you did an IPO in 2021. I mean, uh, was that to raise uh, sort of growth capital or, or I mean, what was the reason? And, and did you did you 
were you happy in in doing that, or was that your investor saying we need an exit? No. Uh, well, <laughs> so what happened in in uh, twenty thirteen was that actually Qualcomm bought most of Arteris. Yes. So, and the reason that the Arteris survived was because Qualcomm legal felt extremely uncomfortable in essentially buying a company and then, uh, you know, essentially taking the product off the market and uh, killing projects at 20 competitors. So they said they, their analysis was this was going to be viewed as a, as a competitive, uh, um, competitive issue. They didn't like some of the contracts. And so what the decision was is they were going to do a giant asset sale and let our terrorist team licensing the main product that was shipping, which was Flexstock, and they kept a bunch of the new technologies we were about to introduce to the every customers. So in beginning of 2014, I wound up with a million dollars out of 26 people and no engineers. <laughs> and I kept flying all over the world reassuring the, the customer base that this was going to be a, an okay situation. Unfortunately, most of them believe me. Oh, good, good. So then, so then basically, um, the the IPO, we didn't want to sell the company again, or, or uh, that's, you know, I, I've already done two M&As in my life, mm. uh, so I didn't want to do that again. And uh, we saw that the system IP has long legs. It's a business that can get much, much larger than it is today um, because these chips are getting very, very... Uh, very, very complex. Yes. And uh, you look at all of these systems that are being built, the automated cars, uh, the the spaceships, you know, uh, some of the stuff like the, the, the SpaceX Starship, they actually, human pilots cannot ex ex execute those maneuvers. They have to be executed by computers, right? So um, uh, you have very advanced uh, drones, right? You you have all this stuff. And, and, and so what I tell people is that the, our human civilization of the 21st century on is going to be based on a foundation of silica. And the amount of uh, SOCs that have to be built is greater than the number of people available. And so we have to automate. And so yeah. we went public uh, to make that vision possible and the uh, okay. intention of, of, uh, of becoming a much larger company over time. Well, I think that's the mantra of, of not just the the semiconductor industry, but also the EDA industry, where it's you know trying to use um, silicon and AI to to sort of enable a lot of the skills that they don't have or or can't get. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we're we're kind of realistic about our place in the food chain, right? Uh, the the system IP is about ten percent of the silicon area, right? Mm. Um, now, I think we're solving more than ten percent of the problem, uh, but the EDA companies are completely essential. I mean, you cannot yeah. uh, you cannot build a chip today without synopsis and cadence, um, mm -hmm. and and so and, and consequently, their you know cadence is thing has a market cap of something like fifty billion. Uh, synopsis is bigger. Uh, Venture or Siemens EDA a little bit smaller uh, in terms of value, even though they're not private. But yes, there's many people who have to contribute. Uh, the the people that build the fabs. People that uh, operate the uh, apps, people do the packaging. You know, in the future, the packaging house will be the king, uh, because yeah. as as things go to chiplets, you're yeah. gonna have to keep assembling different pieces of silicon with with uh, different pieces of functionality into an SOC in a package, right? So um, there's a there's a lot of value to be added by a lot of people, and we're we're one of the key players, but not by any means of uh, the yeah. only one. You, you talked about packaging and chiplets. Um, I wrote a piece um, uh, sort of likening uh, where chiplets are today to where IP was maybe 20 years ago. Yeah, because you know, had things like um, compo you know, IP exchanges and places where you can buy and sell and figure out how to do stuff. Yeah, yeah. And and, and the, the chiplet is not a solution for everything. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, some of the some of the uh, the SOCs will be, will remain single die forever. But if you look at a very very complex system where you have sensors, you have memories, you have a CPU complex, 
Uh, you have uh, a machine learning complex, an AI complex, right? Uh, uh, the chiplets are ultimately uh, the most feasible and ultimately the lower cost solution. Hmm. So there'll be lots of chiplets. And when the chiplets happen, the system IP becomes even more complex, right? So our terrorist keeps continuously being bailed out by increasing complexity of the silicon that people are attempting to build. Excellent. Okay. Let's move a little bit to about uh, some of um, your uh, interests. And um, with, with all this technology, you know, what, what, what's the, the one piece of technology or the technology that you really love and like uh, uh, to use or, 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 or to be uh, yeah, using in your day-to-day -day life? So one of the things I'm really proud of is I've been probably lucky or, or good at picking um, technology ideas that become fairly sizable businesses. And so in 2013, without Qualcomm and, and, and the industry, the, the smartphone industry consolidating down to only three commercial players, which you have today, like Unisoc, MediaTek, Qualcomm, um, we, we needed to find another segment. And so we started focusing on the car, mm -hmm. on transportation. And mm -hmm. so the thing that, to me, I'm most passionate about is helping to create a, transport a giant transportation network. Because uh, the automated driving car, uh, which is today feasible on the highway, but is not yet feasible in the cities, which people don't seem to understand that fully, uh, but it's, uh, the car is just an endpoint. There, there has to be a connection to the cloud. The cars have to talk to each other. They have to talk to roadside infrastructure. Um, there's going to be uh, traffic control centers. And in the end, over the next 20, 30 years, the cities are going to be modified uh, for, for this kind of uh, automated or partially automated uh, uh, transportation uh, capability. And so in some sense, we're transforming uh, the way people move goods and the way they move people. And, uh, and, and there's just uh, huge changes. And it's a huge opportunity because the car itself the, the silicon in the car is about as big as a smartphone market chip market. But when you add that the stoplights will have chips on them, the stop signs will yes. have chips on them, the roads will have sensors. The, the surrounding road, infrastructure. Yeah. Um, the, the, the opportunity for, uh, for automotive uh, uh, growth and, and creating this internet of cars is, is, is just giant. Yeah. And so I feel passionate about being a helper uh, to to make uh, to help make this happen. Yeah, coming back to what's your favorite technology? I guess it's yeah, it's that sort of automation, automa automated automated driving. technology. I mean, one of yeah. the things is, um, you know, I tend to get tired on highways driving because it's boring. I'd rather yeah. do something else. Um, so when I get on a highway, I always turn on the autopilot. Okay. Yeah. And what I'm really looking for is the day, which will come probably next two to three years, where uh, maybe four years. Uh, you're you're not gonna have to pay attention on the highway, and you'll be able to do conference calls. You'll be able to, you know, uh, uh, talk to people, maybe watch a movie, uh, play a game. Uh, that at least on the highway, uh, you are gonna have transportation autonomy. And my dream is to have a RV, electric RV, and you you get on the highway 280 uh, near my house, and you wake up in Las Vegas in a parking lot. Uh, and, and and the car will just take you there overnight, right? That's wow. kind of okay. that's kind of my uh, my dream, and so uh, that's why today it's one of my favorite pieces of technology because it's a even what is there today is an amazing amount of work by you know thousands of engineers and billions mm. of, and it's 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 already an amazing technology. Uh, I, I, I think that's our terrorists, our terrorists is at about seventy to eighty percent of all those ADAS projects, right? Because um, these are very complex chips. That, that yeah. benefit from from a network on chip uh, approach. So, you know, we have big customers uh, such as Mobileye and XP, uh, Bosch, uh, and many many others. There was 120 customers. Or something. I'm sorry, 120 projects. Uh, you know that that sort of vision you paint of you know drive yeah, RV down 280. 280 is one of my favorite uh, freeways anyway. Uh, so scenic. So I think I can just imagine that. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Um, so uh, the uh, what's the what do you feel has been the biggest achievements of your career? Um, 
uh, or yet is it more about your life? Because I think your life and career are in, intertwined as well, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I was one of the fortunate ones that uh, sort of uh, dis discovered uh, his calling in life, not exactly early, but I discovered my calling in life in, in college uh, where, you know, my uh, my grandfather uh, ran a manufacturing company in in, uh, in, uh, in Czechoslovakia and he first yeah. lost uh, to the Nazis because they made some mechanical in, uh, equipment that was useful in in, uh, in tanks and, and fighter aircraft. Uh, then he lost it to the communists. And uh, I, I had a class at Tufts University uh, on uh, um, on 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 business. I knew nothing about business. I come from a family of scientists. And um, the guest speaker was talking about psychology profiles of a manager versus an entrepreneur. And I was so far over on the entrepreneurial side. I said, okay, okay I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to rebuild my grandfather's empire. That's yeah, the, okay. that, and I've, I've been on that path. And uh, uh, even though running a company is very demanding and, uh, and, and, and stressful, I don't feel like I'm working. That's, uh, that's very good. Um, I think I read somewhere that if you weren't, uh, you might have ended up being a professor of ancient military history. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. <laughs> so and, and so how did that come about? Yes, that's, that's true. So um, I, I, I loved history. I was reading history books since I was 10 years old um, and um, probably pretty good at it. And uh, uh, my father, when I was going to college, he says, uh, that's all very nice, but you need to study um, uh, something where you can actually get a job. Yeah. And even though he was a professor of applied math, to him, being a history professor was not a job, I guess. And, and so he okay. said, well... Uh, you're not particularly good in math, so and you shouldn't be an engineer because engineers really get obsolete because the uh, the technology changes. So you really should study science, but you're not that good in math. So uh, which would you like, biology or chemistry? So I said, I'll take chemistry. Chemistry. <laughs> but I never intended to be a chemist, and uh, and so I became basically a, a businessman with uh, with a technical background, which is uh, which I think is is appropriate. And so I still thank my father for yeah. for uh, for not letting me be a prof uh, history professor. <laughs> but, what are you reading? But when I when I when I read books, I read history books. I mean, I still I still love history articles, and I love learning about history and taking lessons from history that can be applied to business. Uh, but I actually have a job. Have, have you read uh, *Sapiens*? I have. I have yeah. written twice, and I also read mm -hmm. Sapiens uh, uh, Homo Deus, uh, yeah. and I completely, uh, th there are some very, very key and relevant thoughts in it, mm -hmm. and one of the things is that I think we are uh, on the path to become much more powerful beings than we are, um, and my biggest fear is that our morality is not keeping up with our technology progress. That is so true. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that will be tested over time, I guess. So I'm reading. So I'm reading a book uh, right now. I almost finished it uh, called uh, Technopoly. Uh, I think it's mm. by Postman. Yeah. And this, it, it basically the the key thought there is that the technology or the 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 worship of technology has killed or damaged uh, some of the stories uh, that made mankind great. Right. Uh, it, it's mm. basically subsumed some of the religious stories that uh, there were sort of uh, the uh, the glue of, of society right so it'll be interesting to see how this uh, how this all, all all turns out yeah yeah now tell me uh, in your hobbies uh, one of them is, is it music and your Bruce Springsteen is that right well yeah I grew up on Jersey Shore and then Bruce Springsteen actually played in one of my high school proms with wow okay he was famous he dated one of my English teachers, um, so he <laughs> was uh, he was extremely popular, and uh, and the uh, and and so so yeah, everybody grew up with uh, Bruce Springsteen music on 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 the on the Jersey Shore. So so, do you go to concerts? <laughs> yeah, I went I I went to a, a Springsteen concert uh, with my wife, uh, you know, a few years ago, and it was uh, it met all the expectations. He's a he's a terrific performer. Performer, yeah, it's good. Um... Uh, I, I, yeah, I think uh, yeah, is all round very good performer. 
let me uh, sort of um, the, the question I asked to all of my uh, guests is, yeah, what would you tell a young uh, Charlie? Uh, what would you tell yourself you know, if you were now uh, coming up? You know, your father uh, told you, you know, to study science, but what would you tell your children? Um, or, or young Charlie? Yeah. What, was, what would be the, the, the biggest piece of advice? What I learned is, is, is pick, pick a viable path and then don't give up. And, and in that, I mean, when you say pick a viable path, and how do you sort of qualify that viable? So, yeah, that, that's hard, right? Because, um, yeah. you know, one of my favorite sayings is that a lot of life is luck, right? Uh, which is why one should never become arrogant because uh, uh, luck can change. And even very smart, very capable people are faced with, uh, with, with difficult situations. They are hard to overcome. But uh, what I mean by that is that uh, there are some businesses you cannot make work, right? And so mm -hmm. it's a... There's a really fun saying by Warren Buffett, which says in a bad business, I'm sorry, in a struggle between good management and a bad business, the bad business usually wins, right? So um, you have to have a vision of what's going to become uh, what's going to become successful. Uh, I think that uh, smartphones were going to become CAD, uh, uh, that, that, that uh, CAD was going to become bit, right? So I went for a CAD company. Um, smartphones who are going to become big automated cars are going to be big and there's going to be ups and downs and you know cruise is going to get banned from san francisco and all that stuff but uh but the trend is clearly up right um mm. i think that another trend is that we are going to become a multiplanetary species right so uh space is another another long-term thing uh i mm. think AI is going to become very very important so people who work in on that uh, are are going to be do very well and then don't get discouraged by the uh, uh, by the ups and downs of, uh, of of that business, and just keep working uh, because eventually it'll 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 pay off. Well, good. Well, Charlie, thank you very much. Okay, it has been great. Thank you for for, for the discussion. 